Welcome to Images and Graphics, Copyright, Creative Commons, and Create Your Own. Today we're going to be talking about what you need to know about copyright as an educator, how you can search for and use images under Creative Commons licensing, and how to create your own images and graphics. We're going to start with copyright. Some of this information is a little dense. We will breeze through some of it and spend more time with other parts, but the goal is just to give you an overview of the, the copyright laws that we are working under so that you can make some informed choices about the images and graphics you do find. Copyright, in a nutshell, provides protection to the authors of content, and of course that content goes well beyond images, but we're just focusing on images for today. It applies to, as you can see a list here, uh, almost anything that one can create, including architectural works. So it gives the author the authority to choose when it gets to be reproduced, if derivatives can be made of it, which means that it can be um, reimagined in some way. And then of course, things like sales and performances. So when we're focusing on images, one thing to be aware of is once an image is created, it automatically is given copyright protection, even if the creator does not go through the US Copyright Office. So if an image doesn't have any information, you really should just assume that it is copyrighted. Some copyright owners do routinely sweep the internet looking for copyright infringements. You may have had this experience yourself. This happens to me uh, every once in a while with videos that I have made. Sweeps could be for images, they also could be for audio. So I have had several videos disabled because the uh, copyright holder for a song wants to know that I have the right to use that song. Once I provide the documentation, it's enabled again. But be aware that there are plenty of ways to automate this and Im image copyright holders are doing just random internet sweeps to see if there are any copyright infringements. Uh, copyright owners can sue for damages. Um, you can get a sense of the amounts here. Willful infringement means that you um, know it was copyrighted and you continue to use it anyway. All right, so as educators, we have fair use as an option right, for um, the works that we can use. So fair use is rather short. This is it in its entirety right here. Fair use allows educators to use a limited amount of copyrighted works for educational purposes. So I've highlighted what some of those purposes are here. Criticism, news reporting, teaching, etc. And in determining whether or not fair use applies, there are four factors. And it's important to note that these factors are to be used to mount a legal defense that you are, are allowed to use this under fair use. So they aren't as perhaps cut and dry and absolute as we as educators would like. They give you indicators as to whether you can claim fair use or not. So we're going to go into these in a little bit of depth just to clarify them. Purpose, nature, amount, and effect. In terms of purpose, if you are using the copyrighted material for a nonprofit educational institution, as Southwestern College is, that leans toward fair use. If it is for an educational use, that does as well. Non-commercial, meaning there's no profit that will be made off of this. Um, restricted access, well, that would be in Canvas. So, so far these factors are leaning toward use. Um, and if it's transformative, that is looked on as a fair use case as well. In other words, it's been used for a different purpose. The nature of the copyrighted work, if it is factual information, it's easier to claim fair use. Creative expression is a little bit harder. Uh, educational in nature, of course, and it's not a consumable. So you can't use a copyrighted workbook and make copies for your students so that they don't have to buy it, for example. Amount used is another important consideration. If it's a small portion of the work, then that is almost always considered an acceptable academic use. 
the, the amount is appropriate for an academic purpose. So you're not sharing an entire textbook with somebody. It has a specific educational use and it's not, what you're sharing is not the heart of the matter. In other words, you're sharing an excerpt, a bit or a piece of it. And so essentially the reason that's important is because of the last one, the effect on the market or the value of that. So if you are sharing let's say that there's an anthology of articles or essays, and you don't want your students to have to buy that whole anthology because you're just going to be studying two of the articles. So if you make copies of those articles or PDFs of those articles and share them with students, then you are doing that so that they don't have to pay for it. And so that is not going to count as fair use. On the other hand, if you just used an excerpt of one to make a point and an excerpt of another to make another point, that's a lot more legitimate. So you don't want to be harming the potential market for the work, providing it so that they don't need to purchase it. I'm not going to, to play the whole thing, but this is uh, one of my favorite fair use overviews. It uses Disney. Disney is notorious for pursuing copyright infringement. And so uh, the person who created this video used all Disney films, little excerpts of them to make the video. And one of the reasons he did this was he wanted to see how Disney would react. And this video was made years ago and it's still up. So it did pass the fair use test. So thinking about the um, criteria that we were just talking about, the purpose, the nature, the amount, and the effect on the market. Notice in just the minute I'm going to show how those things lean toward fair use. What the heck is coffee? Right. What? I mean, what the heck is coffee? Coffee. Go right to the right. Right, 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 right. It's that law that's the problem. You know the law. That stupid law. I mean, what the heck is coffee? Right. I'll tell you. Coffee. Right. Is a permanently fixed. The original work. What? A permanently fixed. The original work. In. Uh, in. Uh, in some form. But. And be seen or heard. Okay, I'm just going to stop right there. So what do you see the, the creator of this doing? Is he taking the essence of these works and using them? Did his use have any effect on the market or the value of those works? In other words, would I not need to go buy Aladdin on DVD now because I was able to watch the movie here? No. Also think about how it was a transformative use. The content has been reworked, modified, or edited for a new use or a new meaning, which is exactly what he did with those different Disney clips. So they were little bits and pieces used for a different purpose. He was making a completely different point with those excerpts. And of course, the amount was very tiny too, right? Just a few words or a single word from many different films. So um, that in a nutshell is copyright and fair use. There also is something called the TEACH Act that you may be familiar with. I wanted to talk about it very briefly, but overall the TEACH Act is not going to apply to us in most situations. This is a newer act that was designed to provide a similar experience for students in online courses to uh, a classroom. So for example, in a classroom, maybe in a dance class, you would wanna show an excerpt from a musical. And in an online class, it's more difficult to do that. Um, it applies only to nonprofit accredited educational institutions, but it does require that the institution and the instructor follow very specific steps for copyright notification in order to qualify for the TEACH Act, things that most colleges do not do. Um, it doesn't address things like um, digital resources that come with textbooks. Again, it can't be in lieu of purchasing something. Um, and it does not cover converting things to digital format. So if you would go into a classroom and show something on a DVD, it doesn't cover um, translating that over to a digital format. So here's what it does do. It allows performances mostly of literary and musical works. 
but it has to be a reasonable portion, not the whole thing. Uh, it has to be in a comparable amount to that which is typically displayed in the course session. And here's the kicker for a similar amount of time. So in a face-to-face -face class, if you might show that excerpt from a musical in the class, you might show 20 minutes of it during one class period. That's the equivalent you would have to set up in an online environment. So you would have to make it available to your students for a very limited amount of time and have them watch it during that time to try to replicate that face-to-face -face environment. Also, you would have to limit access, meaning you would put it into Canvas, which we have covered. You would have to inform the students of copyright laws and local policies before sharing it. And you would probably have to work with IT to ensure that there are mechanisms to prevent students from downloading, redistributing, or copying it. So the TEACH Act is um, difficult to put into practice. I think fair use is, is the, the exception that will be used much more commonly. And if you're thinking, wow, I had no idea. It was so complicated. Don't worry. There actually are some alternatives and one of them is Creative Commons. When you are searching for materials, you are searching from the beginning for things that are already labeled for your use. It will be much easier to use what you find. And Creative Commons is the way that many people do that. So Creative Commons works alongside existing copyright law. It allows the creator of something to maintain whatever rights he or she would like, but also to enable others to use it. So as the creator of this content, you can put a Creative Commons license on it that matches what you would like others to be able to do with it and they can do the same thing and share it with you. You may or may not know that all of the grant funded projects from the California Community College are required to have Creative Commons licenses. So anything that you see from the online education initiative, such as the uh, rubric or the um, student success tutorials, those are all Creative Commons licensed so that everybody gets to share. Same thing with anything produced from at one. So Creative Commons is a really great way to keep your information attributed to you, but let other people use it. There are several different types of licenses that you could choose or that you might find when you're doing a search. And they basically break down into these categories. Do you want to allow people to use it? So that's kind of the base of a Creative Commons license. Do you want to require them to attribute it to you so they will use your name when they are using this information? Do you want to allow commercial use? Do you want to allow people to modify and adapt it or do they have to use it as is? And do you want to allow them to set up their own licensing terms if they do adapt it? So those are the key questions, and based on your answers, you would choose one of these Creative Commons licenses. It doesn't cost anything to Creative Commons license your work. It's absolutely free, and it's as simple as just typing out the letters for the license that you want to use. Creative Commons also has graphics that you can use that indicate these different licenses. Here's an example of an image that has Creative Commons licensing. There are many different ways that you can share the Creative Commons attribution, but the essential ingredients are the name of it, the type of license, and the attribution to who created it. So those are kind of the three elements that we have here. So the title of this is Education is All. It is a CC by 2.0 license. And the creator is Cog Dog Blog. And all of these are links so you could go there and see more things by Cog Dog Blog if you wanted to. And if you are thinking, well, that sounds great, but how am I going to remember all of that? If you choose your images from Flickr, which is a huge database, you can actually use something called Image Coder that will generate that attribution for you. So the attribution we see at the bottom of this page with Cog Dog Blog was actually created by Image Coder. So we're going to go out there and I'll, and I'll show you um, how that works. But essentially, um, you find the image that you like, you paste it into this website called Image Coder, and then it gives you 
this license for you to paste either independently underneath your photo or even along with your photo. You can grab the complete embed code to just plop the whole thing into your Canvas page. So uh, we're going to go try that out. I'm going to go to the Creative Commons search here. And the search area lets you designate if you want to search for Flickr only. You also could search Google Images, um, Wikimedia Commons, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to do Flickr so that we can try out the image coder as well. I would simply type in what I am searching for here. Hmm, what am I searching for? Let's do a smartphone. So I type in smartphone. I can start narrowing down my use needs here. Like if I need to use it for commercial purposes, I would leave this checked. I'm using it for education, so I don't need that. I'm not planning on modifying it either. I just want a nice image of somebody on a smartphone. So I do the search. It brings me into Flickr. Hmm, I actually really like this one. Let me take a closer look. I click on it and there it is. If this was the one that I was interested in using, I could click here to see what the Creative Commons license is. It looks like it's the generic 2.0, which means I'm allowed to share it. I'm allowed to remix it if I'd like to, as long as I give the appropriate credit to the creator. If I want to use this image, I can either download it here and get started, or I can go over to Image Coder and have that attribution done for me. And I'm going to put that URL in here, give it a second or two, and there. So this looks a lot like the image we were just looking at. It reminds me of what the license is, and it gives me a preview of what it will look like. So here's the image, and here is the attribution created for me. And I can either just grab this attribution and paste it into the page where I already have this image, or if I'm starting from scratch, I can grab this HTML code here, copy it, go over to my Canvas page where I want to use this image. Remember, this was HTML code. I can simply paste it in to the HTML code area and look at that. The image and the attribution right underneath it. And then of course I would want to do more here, right? I would need to perhaps resize the image, give it alternative text, give it some text introducing the image. I'm sure it's not being used by itself, but you can see how easy it is to get that image and the attribution put right into your page. So, Image Coder, to go back to that site, um, is designed to work with Flickr. So you can recreate this kind of attribution for any image that you're allowed to use, but the Image Coder program will only work with images that you get from Flickr. So Flickr might be a good first stop for you, but if you find something somewhere else, it's the same structure. So as you see here, the name of it, then the license, then the person who is sharing it, are the three ingredients that you would need. Um, there's another way that you might find images and that's from within Canvas itself. So if I go back into this page that I'm playing around with here, and let's say that I had another image that I wanted to use. So I'm doing a unit on modern ways of, of communicating. And maybe I want an image to go right here of um, people having a conversation. So a great feature in Canvas is that we can go to the image icon on the editor and we can search for something in the built-in Flickr integration. So I know a lot of people use this and this is another good way to access Flickr. So if I was looking for, I'm just gonna type in conversation. Let's see what comes up. All right, here are some people having conversations, or I could just use an icon. So let's say that I wanted to use this one here. Ooh, or this one looks nice. So I would pick my image, and then I would put in the alt text. So 
So I'm going to call mine Seated Ladies Deep in Conversation. I'm not even sure if they're all ladies because it's so small. So I may have to go back and change that. But let's put it in here and see. Oh, I think I was lucky there. So here is my image from Flickr. So let me show you what that would look like. One of the great things about the Flickr integration is that if you have, have an image on the page, you or your students can use that image to go directly to its location in Flickr where all the attribution information is available. So according to Creative Commons flexible licensing, this does actually meet the bare minimum because by clicking on it, we go to Flickr, we can see the licensing, we can see the name of it, and we can see the creator. All of those three pieces that we needed are right here. So you can use an image as is like that through Canvas, but if you want to be modeling best practices for our students, you might want to put this attribution underneath it. So you could either create it based on all of that information that we see here on the page in Flickr, or if you want to let Image Coder do the work for you, you can grab that URL and go over to Image Coder and paste it in to the box. There's just one thing that you need to do. Although it's a little bit hard to see, if you look carefully at this, you're gonna see it doesn't actually have HTTPS and then the slashes and then flickr.com. The word secure is in here. And that's because we got it from within Canvas, which is a secure password protected environment. Image Coder can't get into our Canvas class, right? That's, a, that's not an open web page, but the Flickr page is. So to use Image Coder with a Flickr image you found in Canvas, you just have to delete the word secure and the period from the URL. You just delete that and then click on get code and it should bring it right up for you. There it is. There's my image. There's my code. So you can use Image Coder from or with, I should say, the Flickr website or you can use it within Canvas. I wanted to move on to talk about one other kind of licensing that we haven't covered yet. You will see um, that these examples in the slide kind of match up with what we were just doing. So we just used the Canvas Flickr integration. Um, we grabbed that URL. We took out the word secure with the period, and then we got the code to put right into a page. So these slides will refresh your memory and walk you through how to do the steps that we just did. So there's one other kind of Creative Commons licensing that is really helpful, and that is a public domain license. And so that is represented as a CC, Creative Commons, zero, meaning that there is zero uh, license on it. So a public domain uh, attribution just means that there is no active copyright holder um, who has a claim to it. So there are several ways that it could get into the public domain. You as the creator could choose to make it public domain. You just created it for anyone to use however they want to. They don't have to mention your name. It's just out there for people to use. A lot of people, especially in education, are choosing to share freely like this. It also could end up in the public domain if the copyright holder no longer has a claim on it because it has been um, around for so long and the copyright claim has ended. There are a lot of databases out there that you can use to find images that don't have any copyright on them at all that are in the public domain. So you'll see down here, National Gallery of Art is one, New York Public Library public domain is another one. These are going to uh, contain mostly images that are in the public domain because of their age. If you want some newer images that are in the public domain because of choice, you probably want to look at the top of this list. So these are three websites that you can go to to find free public domain images that the creators have freely shared. So I'm going to show you one of them just to um, give you a sense of what's out there. So I'm going to go to Pexels, which is one of my favorite places to go for photos now. You can search by whatever keywords you would like. Let's see. I'm going to go for that uh, phone again. Let's see what's here. 
So I think one of these was actually in Flickr. This does draw from Flickr. Um, but look at how great some of these images are. Wouldn't this look nice in a class? Or how about this one? Or this one for collaborative learning? So these are all much more modern images that are designed to kind of tell a story or create some visual interest. And if I click on one of these, I can uh, see the license right here. So there's that CCO or zero indicating public domain. And I can get a free download of it right here. I can even choose what size I want my download to be. And remember, because this is public domain, attribution is not required. I mean, I could choose to, to um, put in an attribution, again, to model best practices for my students. And if I wanted to, for the license, I would put the CCO. Here's the person who contributed this image. And sometimes the image will have a, a title, sometimes it won't. Um, this one would, looks like it is untitled. So this is a really great resource for um, those times when you want uh, an image, but you don't have one in your own personal image collection that would meet that need. If you come here and look through Pexels, you're very likely to find what you want. In fact, we didn't even keep scrolling here, but look at all these other images that are here. Lots and lots, and they're very high resolution as well. Pixabay is similar. In fact, you'll find some images in both places. Uh, Morg file often has things that are a little bit older as well as some of um, the newer public domain options. So it's worth bookmarking all of them just so you can take a, you know, take a look and see what's out there. Let's then talk a little bit about creating your own. So sometimes you just can't find the right thing. So you could take some pictures yourself and then of course you, you are in charge of them, can do whatever you want with them. Uh, and sometimes maybe it's not a photo you need at all, maybe it's a graphic. And if you are really just looking for a graphic, like a logo or a banner or um, something that combines words and images, then these are some options that may really help you meet that need. So there are three that I'm spotlighting here, although there certainly are others. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these three free graphic design programs that you can use to create your own. PicMonkey is probably the oldest of the three. This is really designed originally for working with photos. So you can upload a photo, you can add a text overlay, kind of like the example you see here. You can touch up the photo, you can make photo collages, uh, and you can use a wide variety of fonts and frames and stamps and things like that to make the photo look exactly how you want it to look. So PicMonkey is a good option if you have something that you're starting with that is a photo. PictoChart is good for making infographics. In fact, it's probably the most well-known tool to make infographics. So PictoChart lets you take your numbers, your statistics, your data, and turn it into a visually appealing infographic like you can see here. You also can use it to show processes uh, because the graphic elements let you put arrows between things. They let you visually display instructions, perhaps. So PictoChart is um, a good option if you want to make an infographic. And then Canva, the reason Canva has a little heart here is because it can actually do all of that and you can be used to create your own graphics. So we're going to go out to Canva and um, take a look at what your options are there um, and get your creative juices flowing. So I'm going to click on this link here and take us out to Canva. Canva is completely free, but you will need an account. And as you can see here, education is the top kind of user. It's become very, very popular with educators. Um, but there are some other options for it as well. And in fact, once you start working in Canva, you might recognize some of its designs on websites that you visit. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. And you can see my Canva account. So my account is full because I use this quite a bit. And Yours, when you first sign up, will be a little bit empty. Every design you've ever made, you can keep here, and then you can go in and you can edit it too. So uh, for example, just to show you a few different um, uses of Canva, 
you can use it for slides. So these are some slides from a presentation that I did a few years ago. And there's a cover slide. There are um, content slides. And as you can see, these are a mix of images and text. So we used Canva to um, design some key slides for a presentation. I have used it to design slides for a voice thread that my students use. So this was a voice thread slide where students would say goodbye to each other with a couple images from places that we visited. And I can update this as needed. I use it often for banners as well. So here's an example of a, a banner that I would use in a class on the homepage. And you'll notice that some of these look very similar, right? Because after I've made one and gotten it just how I like it, I can copy it and make a perfect copy of it underneath. And I can call this one whatever I want. And so I will make banners that I can change uh, every couple of weeks in my class. I already have the starter banner and I'm just updating the text and maybe changing the picture behind it. And then you can also see that you can use Canva just to create numbers or icons or things like that. Um, I've used it to create signs, to create um, cover slides for videos so that that's what people see before they click on the video to start it. There are so many different possibilities here. So I'm going to create one with you just so you can get a sense of what it's like. So once you click on create a design, you're given some options. Do you want to make a presentation? And if we chose that one, we'd be looking at different slide sets. So in this case, it asks us to pick one of the layouts that we like and put it here. So let's say um, we like this one here. I click on it. It opens it up to show me the different slide types. And I just click on them to put them here in my slide deck. And then I can change the name. I can add a new page and maybe this is the one I want there. And then I just click here and I can change the wording to say whatever I want. Going back to our design options, you can see that you also can do banners. Leaderboard would create a nice thin banner for maybe a content page in your class. The Etsy design is the one that we use to make banners in the um, the templates that are shared in the Canvas Commons. You can make social media sized graphics. Down here under documents, you can make um, letterhead, certificates. And then you'll see there also, if we scroll down a little bit, are um, things like marketing materials and here's an infographic. So if I wanted to make an infographic, I have a bunch of different layouts that are already set up. I just pick one and then I can start editing it. So I can change the words, I can change the text, I could change the images if I wanted to. I can zoom in and zoom out until it's all done. And so it's very quick and easy to create something that is well designed. And you'll notice that all of these have a little free tag on them. That means that every element in this design you can use for free. But if you scroll through something uh, long enough, you're, you're bound to find some that are not free. Okay, here's one right there. There's a little dollar sign. So if I choose to use this one, I will need to pay for its use. The vast majority of the items in Canva are free. The other thing that you can do in Canva is you can upload your own images and use those in the works that you create. And so I can put any of this into my um, document. So let's say I wanted to make this logo a part of the writing up here. And so then maybe this text would start over here. And then I can go ahead and use whatever other elements I want to from Canva. And the elements you'll find here on the menu are many. They have shapes. I could put one of these shapes in here. Uh, they have a variety of icons. So if I didn't want Twitter here, 
let's say instead I wanted to have, um, hmm, how about a brain? So I could take this brain, resize it, and instead of the Twitter icon, maybe I'd like to have the brain in this circle instead. And so I might have something here, maybe a cognitive theory, and then I could go customize this one with um, another image and another topic. So it's very fast and easy to grab what you need and put it over here. And of course you can recolor things as well. So if I wanted to change the color scheme, I could. So it's all very, very customizable. You can add your own um, text styles as well. You can see there are lots of those. Most of them are free. There are a few that um, would cost money to use. So this is uh, not very well designed because I have not really spent much time with it, but let's say that this is the, what I wanted to use and I'm ready to go. If I wanna put this into my class, it's as simple as downloading it when I'm done. So I would click on download and it would ask me how I want to save it. So you can save it as an image file, JPEG or PNG, or you could save it as a PDF if you were going to use it for printing and then you would click on download. And in a couple of seconds, it will show up in your download tray and then you're ready to bring it into your Canvas course. So I'm going to actually go over in my course just to show you how that works. So here we are in my course. This is going to be a very crowded page. So let's say this is the page that I want it to be on. I have two options to bring it in. I could bring it in right here on the page by going into edit clicking on images from the sidebar and uploading a new image. So I would choose the file and bring it in here. The other way I can do it is by going into the files area of my course and dragging and dropping it right into the files or into the folder where I want it. I could drop it in here and then I could go find it over here from my page. I'm gonna do it both ways so you can see it in both situations. If I go to downloads, there it is. I'll have an opportunity to put my alternative text here. And then I will upload it. It'll put it into the files area of my course and it also will put it on the page. And then I'll resize it as needed. So if I click on save, we can see what this looks like. Infographics tend to be pretty big because they have text in there as well. So I would probably want to resize this a little bit. They also can be challenging in terms of alternative text because if this were what I created and I actually was using all of this text here, that text would need to be provided for people who couldn't see it. And there really isn't enough room to put all of that in the alternative text. So in that case, I would have a link underneath it to a text equivalent of this, where I would just copy the text from my infographic, paste it into maybe a Google Doc, and share the link. So that's a good way to make sure that it's still accessible if you have a lot of complex text on the page. So that, in a nutshell, is Canva. And remember that anything that you create in Canva, you will be able to save and then you can go in. So if I go to all my designs, I can go into any one of these and I can make copies of it. Um, I can have a whole collection. So for example, if I go into my banners for my world literature class, you'll see that I did one banner the way I liked it. And then I just made copies of it each time I needed a new banner. So they all look the same. They all have the same coloring. And if I'm doing another course and I want different colors, I can make a copy of the banner and just change the colors. So Canva is great for creating a uniform design for your course. And then the last thing I wanted to let everybody know is you actually can share your designs with others. So I have a banner that I have shared with um, faculty at Southwestern College. It is part of the course template and people can click on it come here and create a banner. And as you can see, we have several different banners that people have created, and this is always kind of changing and growing because people are just making a copy of the banner that exists here and then making it theirs and saving it. Wow, there's all kinds of good stuff here. So you can share and collaborate with uh, people that you are teaching or designing with. 
I'm going to stop talking and let you start designing. Thanks for joining us.